So I'm pleased to be able to move to our final set of presentations. And we've gone kind of all around the world. And we're actually coming right back home, because we're going to be uh, hearing about a program that occurred right here in Kelowna. And uh, it's called Active and Smoke-Free Dads. And the folks who will be talking to you are Dr. John Olaf, who's an associate professor at the School of Nursing in UBC's Vancouver campus, and Dr. Joan Batorf, director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention, a professor in the School of Nursing um, here on the o Okanagan campus and the Faculty of Health and Social Development. So welcome. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here to tell you about um, our program of research. Um, this program of research is called, the, we fondly call the FACET Project, which is short for Families Controlling and Eliminating Tobacco. So unlike the previous health, men's health promotion programs you've just heard about, this one's going to focus specifically on uh, tobacco use and supporting men's smoking cessation. So I want to tell you first about the FACET story. So we started out this research to actually try and support families in their efforts to um, become smoke free. And we really focused on women first off. We were interested in finding better ways to uh, help pregnant and postpartum women reduce and stop smoking. And we wanted to develop better tailored approaches. And so our aim was really around interventions. In the course of some of that research, we began to realize that not only were we talking with women who were reducing and stopping smoking and learning about their efforts, but at the same time we talked to their partners. And we learned that many of the partners we talked to were also smokers, but they weren't really doing anything about their smoking at this time. And as we began to look at the statistics, we realized that you know, it wasn't just the few men that we were talking to that were smokers, there's actually quite a large number of men in this age group who, are, uh, who become expectant new fathers who smoke. And we also learned that very few of them reduce during their partner's pregnancy. And so you can imagine that this might create some extra challenges for a woman who's pregnant and who's trying to reduce and stop smoking. We also know that despite our lowering tobacco rates in Canada, there's still really an unacceptable number of children who are exposed to secondhand smoke. And it doesn't all come from mothers who, who may be smoking. Fathers also contribute to that. And so we thought, you know, maybe it's time we started to pay more attention to fathers who smoke, since most of our attention up until now has been on pregnant and postpartum women and mothers. So we thought, we started talking to men, and we learned a lot about their smoking patterns, and we learned about some of their challenges in reducing and stopping smoking, particularly at this time that they were becoming fathers. And we thought, you know, at father, during fatherhood, they actually become motivated to begin to reduce and stop smoking because many of them want to be ideal dads. And that actually some of their stories were really, really heartwarming about how important being a father was and how much they wanted to be the best fathers they could be. And yet they knew that um, an ideal father was not a smoking father. So we thought, you know, here are men that are beginning to think about their smoking and are motivated to make some changes, but having some real difficulty in, in actually making this happen. And we thought, you know, if we could figure this out, how to help fathers reduce and quit smoking, we would actually accomplish a whole lot. We could support women's efforts to reduce and stop smoking. We know that having a partner who smokes is one of the main relapse factors in, in, during the postpartum period for women. We could support men's health. It wouldn't it be great if we could prevent some of those heart attacks when men are 45 and 50 and 55. We could also create more smoke-free homes for women, or for children, and for women as well. So it's almost like a no-brainer. And it's like, why haven't we been focusing on men? And so we took up this challenge. And we asked, you know, how do we support new fathers who want to quit? And so we held consultation groups with expectant and new fathers who are smokers or had recently quit. And we shared some of our findings with them. And we asked them, so how can we help you quit? What do you need? Uh, what would work best for you? And these are some of the things that we learned. That they wanted positive messages um, and things that would help promote change. 
They didn't want any of this shame and blame that often is associated with smoking. And we could see from their talk that there was an opportunity to, to create some positive connections with positive identities. They realized that you know, the good father in their eyes was not a smoking father. So perhaps we could build on that a desire to be good fathers to help motivate smoking cessation even in a stronger way. Men were also pretty clear they wanted to make up their own mind about when and how they were going to stop smoking. They didn't want us telling them what to do and when to do it. They also told us that they wanted a lot of support. They actually wanted to help each other reduce and stop smoking. And they wanted to hear the stories of other men who were successful and maybe even challenged in their efforts to stop smoking. They wanted interaction uh, to interact and to be active in this process of reducing and stopping smoking. Um, and of course, interestingly, when we asked them about the kind of programs they wanted and if it would be helpful to include their partners, they said, no, we want a men's only approach here. And so we took them at their word and we began to develop some resources that would support them. And we began with a booklet and we called it The Right Time, The Right Reasons. This actually came out of a quote from one of our fathers. And as you can see by the cover, quit smoking next exit. You can take that exit or not, it's entirely up to you. So again, a way of supporting men's autonomous decision making related to this. You can see in the title as well, dads talk about reducing and quitting smoking. Here, the booklet is entirely uh, focused with the voice of fathers. There's no expert voice here. So in some ways it mimics that men sharing stories with men. The words in this booklet come directly from the interviews that we got from fathers. Um, and through this booklet, it's really not a how to quit booklet at all. It's a motivational resource to help fathers take that first step to becoming smoke free. So there's a very strong focus on fatherhood in this whole booklet and engaging uh, new dads in thinking about being a smoke-free dad. We provide a bit of education through an interactive quiz in the booklet as well around secondhand smoke and uh, smoking and its effects on infants and children. Sometimes men had it right, but not always. Some men thought that a little exposure to secondhand smoke would just toughen up a kid for other things that they meet down the road. So there was clearly a need for some education. But we, what we hope that this booklet would do was really inspire men to uh, reach a tipping point, to take that first step to become smoke free. They also told us that they wanted to help each other. They wanted a group program, which we were really surprised about because we thought there's not many group programs that focus on men's health. And to hear that coming from these young men was really a surprise, but this is what they wanted. And so based on their suggestions that we gathered in this consultation group and our previous research, as well as what we know about smoking cessation, we developed a tailored program specifically for expected new dads, and we called it Dads in Gear. This program is unique because it includes three components. One is fathering, one is exercise, and one is tobacco reduction. So these three components are integrated in an eight-week program. As you can see, we conducted it at a, a gym. The fathering component is included because that was one of the main motivators for smoking cessation was fathering. So we wanted to actually support men in their fathering, increase confidence in fathering, to give these men new skills that they might be able to use in their fathering, to become more engaged in fathering because we hypothesize the more engaged they are in fathering, the more motivated they will be to quit. We included exercise because men told, me, told us it was very stressful being a new dad. Um, they had new responsibilities. There were, uh, uh, they had to provide childcare. They had to combine that with their work life. And many of them had stressful jobs as well. And so we included exercise as a stress management strategy because we know that that also will help with smoking cessation. And also, it plays into their role as fathers because they all wanted to be fit to play soccer with their kids when they kids grew up old enough to play soccer. Uh, tobacco reduction, we gave them tips 
We, I gave them information about tobacco reduction. We gave them strategies. And then we said, you know, it's up to you. Here's an opportunity for you to reduce and stop smoking. You decide how, you decide when, and provided that opportunity. I'm going to turn it over to John now to tell you about a little more about the DIG program and where we're taking it now. As Joan sort of mentioned, this positive messaging to promote change. So it's very easy to talk about what blokes aren't doing, especially when they're smoking. So we, we, we tried to talk to, you know, the exercise component uh, about increasing personal bests around the ex exercise piece, um, about reducing smoking. So if you could just even cut back, that was, that was a good enough start. So it was trying to really trade on the positive aspects of, of masculinities as we talk about, you know, certain behaviours. The testimonials of the fellas was was so um, poignant in the in the booklet that that you know we it was difficult to kind of transcribe that into a face to face program. But these guys developed their own testimonials, so they would share their insights about you know uh, trying to reduce, trying to cut back, their difficulties with exercise, their difficulty with finding time, and a lot of positive things around fathering. So they connect on their own levels. Uh, across these testimonials. So it was very, very powerful. So we didn't have to manufacture that like we did perhaps in the book. And these masculine ideals are strength, a strength-based notion. So a strength-based piece around being a smoke-free dad. So wrapping that up in a, in a kind of a normalised uh, way of being a, being a dad and being a, uh, being a guy. And attention to masculinity. So that when, we, when we talk about masculinity, typically we're, we're talking about a plurality, like a diversity within the guys. So, OK, they're all dads, they all smoke, but they'll find their own ways towards reducing and quitting smoking. So we were sort of cognizant of those things. So we wanted to, you know, apply some principles that would try and help move everyone forward that was within the group. Um, the sessions were, were two and a half hours. We, we ran for for eight weeks um, and we pilot tested it in a, in a gymnasium as, as Joan mentioned. It was facilitated by program leaders. Um, the guy, uh, we had a, we, Gail was there who worked with us um, on the project. We also had a guy who was a, uh, a dad but not a smoker um, who helped facilitate the program as well and Joan and I popped in and out for the various sessions. And it was, um, it was really, really quite good. Um, lots of camaraderie and lots of humour within the group and they manufactured that kind of humour themselves as well. It's kind of like a friendly competitiveness that went on around the gym, around uh, reducing smoking, and, and lots, of, um, lots of connection around fathering, which was interesting as well. The themes, there was a little syllabus that sat underneath each of the sessions, so um, the idea was to give it a masculine look and feel. We were in a gymnasium, so we felt like we were in, the, in a, a good spot where guys could connect, um, but also we, we themed uh, each of the weeks. So, uh, puck in the net, full house, fishing for answers, games people play, let's walk, let's eat, which was a, a, a particular week where we walked to the supermarket and, and uh, they were showing how to make a particular meal. Um, uh, where the wild things are, bases are loaded, uh, kids are worth it. So there's a whole kind of strength-based theme with this and each week it would involve some activities that worked in with this, um, with this tripartite piece around reducing smoking increasing activity uh, and also connecting around, you know, some skills around fathering. The key learnings, I guess, for us was, um, you know, I think we've known in community health uh, that, that mutual help is, is really key. Uh, we've done work with prostate cancer support groups where this kind of this notion of helping each other um, and trading information, and it does seem to work. I'd say the same with the men's sheds piece is often it's, it's wrapped up in this notion of, of, of sharing knowledge, which I think really helps. So we certainly, certainly learned the value of that. Um, they actually did connect so strongly across being dads. And there is a discourse around being a, a present dad and being um, more active, uh, less of the absent provider of previous generations. And, and certainly those guys did really buy into that and some of the challenges associated with that, but also some of the, some of the really good things that go along with that. Um, they, the, the credibility of the facilitators, I think, you know, it was kind of, it was interesting because uh, they pitched us, uh, a lot of us as coaches and I think that was, that was interesting that they did that um, and you were there kind of encouraging them and pushing them along and I think the credibility of people, you know, doing that and taking an interest in them, the old Hawthorne effect, if, you, if you're watching and you're kind of encouraging it, does push people along. So I thought it was, uh, it was really helpful in that way. 
And again, it was about, there was no prescription and there was, you know, it was not a recipe to quitting. This is how you do it. We were very, very pushing along, just trying to help people be the best they could be in terms of being a dad who was smoke free. Of course, you know, with the program, I, you know, previous uh, presentations with Mitch and Christina, you know, cost associated with some of these, some of these programs is, is quite high. This was a little pilot test. We had six participants. It was $50,000, you know, so we could pilot test it. We could collect some data. We had a sense that it worked well. We had good feedback. We had some quitters. It was good. But again, you know, in making that material and what we'd learnt accessible to greater numbers of guys, uh, we thought that probably the next step would be to move it into an online forum, uh, which we're in the midst of doing uh, at the moment in the latest part of the project. So, you know, we were driven by this notion of making it accessible to more men, allowing them to be able to access it on their own terms because, of course, scheduling of a face-to-face -face uh, program can cut some people off with work commitments, childcare commitments, and so we wanted to uh, wanted to try and develop this in an online forum. One of the key parts of, of the web development, and again, as Mitch and Christina talked to, um, around you know making websites interactive uh, and the web 2.0 kind of piece, and, and uh, we really wanted to do that. So we wanted to develop some of the resources around fathering, around activity, and around smoking reduction. And we wanted to develop them into you know, web-based 2.0, what we say 2.0, something interactive, something the guys could, could grab hold of in terms of content. So part of that is a development of 12 videos. And they, again, looked at the different aspects of the program. The one I'll share with you um, uh, from, from that suite of uh, developing um, uh, videos is, uh, is from one of the dads. This winter, before I actually quit smoking, um, I started a new job working with a friend of mine and there's a group of four people including me and we all smoked. And I started working with them in the winter time and they were really giving it a real good shot at trying to quit smoking and there's the three of them who they'd come to work without a pack of cigarettes in, with intentions of not smoking that day. I always said, okay, well, yeah, I'm gonna really try with you guys. I'm gonna try, but the whole time in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I am not gonna be able to come to work without a pack of cigarettes because it just goes hand in hand. You go to work and you bring your smokes and you make sure you have them before you start your day. I didn't know, I didn't think I would be able to quit. Like they were trying really hard and they today are still smoking. Whereas I found what I really needed to find was the thought of my family and that's what really drove me to quit smoking it was thinking about Mason and the disappointment it would bring upon them if I didn't quit I knew I had to quit and it was just a matter of time so I finally picked a date and I successfully quit smoking there's a couple of different reasons why I really wanted to quit smoking the main one being I didn't want to grow up uh, being a father that smoked I wanted Mason to grow up in a smoke-free environment. I grew up with my dad and mom who both smoked. My mom eventually quit, but my dad still smokes, and I think that has a lot to do with why I became a smoker. And I just never wanted my son to grow up like that. Um, I was never that concerned about what other people thought about my smoking habits. I'd been told countless times, I need to quit smoking, you know, smoking's bad for you. Everybody tells you what not to do. Um, it never really phased me until I was told that I was going to be a father and that's when I really took initiative to just outright quit smoking. I only had to try one time to quit and since January the 6th I haven't had a cigarette so it's over eight months now. I hate to say it, it felt easy, it was hard at times but it, it felt easy because I didn't want to smoke. When I actually decided to put my foot down and quit. I didn't want to go back and disappoint Jody and my son, and that's how I really didn't have a cigarette. I, I knew that if I had one, that it was just going to be a disappointment, and I was stronger than that. So I dealt with the cravings by just thinking about my family and the reasons why I was quitting smoking. I never actually did anything physically to stop the cravings. I just would just think to myself how it would you know, look to my family and friends like 
I felt like I would be a failure to them if I am trying to quit smoking and then here I am having a cigarette, like for what? To satisfy my needs? It wasn't important to me after that. I still have a lot of cravings. Every time I see other people with cigarettes, I want to have a cigarette. And I don't know when that's going to go away or if it ever will, but I just kind of deal with it and put it in the back of my mind, everything in my life that's more important than cigarettes. I've learned that I am stronger than I thought I was. I always talked about quitting smoking at one point in my life. I never thought it would be as simple as it was. You really just have to stop smoking. I really feel like I've made it look too easy for my friends and others and make it sound too easy, but there were some really, really hard times where I was sick, ill, and like shaking on the couch, you know, just holding myself back from running to the store and buying a pack of cigarettes. It was really, really hard at times. I did persevere and I got through it and I feel great because of it. I've never felt better. I really haven't felt better. I feel great. I'm really happy with my life now. I really miss smoking, but I know that I'm better because of being able to quit. I feel proud of myself, I really do. It was hard, but it was, it was worth it. So that was um, one of the videos and there's 12 of those and uh, not all testimonials of, of, of the dads but that's certainly um, one that's, uh, uh, one that's uh, pretty close to being, being ready. I actually like the reverb on it, um, on that. It's not, not on the other, uh, not on the version that's on the web but I actually like the reverb. We should think about that. I'd like to thank Gail and Surveyor too uh, for all of their hard work with these videos. It's been um, sensational. Um, and so within that, uh, that web 2.0 forum as well, you know, that notion of, of trying to get some more interactivity so that the guys can uh, self-monitor, put, uh, put some details in there as well about their smoking around their activity and sort of uh, some self-markers uh, to look at personal bests and, and improvement around those areas. Um, and certainly we're in the midst of developing the, the website um, to its kind of full transition and trying to work out, you know, what combination of face-to-face -face versus um, online would, uh, would work best. And we've had a, a good day and a half chatting about that with lots of experienced people um, who, uh, who have talked to us today as well. So it was a very fruitful couple of days. Again, there's lots of people involved in these, um, in these projects. Um, there's uh, lots of community partners. Um, they're listed there. We've had very generous funding over a long period of time from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research um, as well um, and uh, lots and lots of partners, uh, almost too many to list there. We also do have some presence on Facebook and MySpace and all these other spots as well, or Joan has some presence there at least. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and another website there which is the FACET website which is undergoing some changes as well in the next little while. So thank you very much. What's the ridiculousism rate for your, uh, your team? How many went back to, uh, people that went back to smoking? Uh, or were they all able to, you know, walk on that higher plane and the sun or what happened to them? You know, um, this is a, a very young mobile group and so we haven't been able to follow everyone. But we have been able to follow one young man who was in the group and uh, we actually have a video of him that we uh, weren't able to share today, but he actually has remained smoke-free. And he's, he's really, really proud of the fact that he's been able to do it. We know probably that some of these men have gone back to smoking because in fact, at the end of the group, they didn't want the group to quit. Uh, but um, this was a trial project. It was Christmas. Uh, we said, you know, we, we need to quit. Um, and so we do need to think about long-term follow-up, how we continue, can continue to support men and, and help them maintain their abstinence. That being said, it takes numerous times to quit smoking, as, as is often known. And so even if men did go back, we don't necessarily see that as a failure. The fact that they use this opportunity to reduce and stop smoking puts just one more tick up there in terms of another quit attempt so that the next time they try this, they might actually be successful. So in some ways, although our long-term goal is certainly maintenance and being smoke-free, um, the fact that they could re would reduce or could reduce and even use this opportunity as a quit attempt 
in our mind is a positive outcome as well. So I think you know we're, we have several ways that we can determine the outcomes of this project. And clearly uh, we need um, a, a, a larger implementation and evaluation to sort out the kind of outcomes that we could expect from a program like this. The other outcomes of course that we're expecting are increased involvement in fathering. Uh, we think that that's a really important outcome as well as um, uh, increases in physical activity. So um, our focus is not only on, on smoking, but um, certainly it's an important focus. Thank you. We've got a very interesting question from Robert Ablanis, and he says, I'm wondering about diversity among DIG program participants. Since there's more than one way to construct masculinity, I'm curious if the strategy, and he uses a direct quote, to connect masculine ideals with smoke-free posed any challenges with respect to getting any guys to change behavior in the desired direction. It's interesting, the whole masculinities piece has been pitched around what guys don't do. So it tends to be masculinity is being damaging for health. And when we interviewed so many dads who smoked, they had these masculine ideals around being a good dad and it was discordant with smoking. You know, so there's a whole, a whole piece around the strength to be smoke free, the autonomy to decide how to do it. So it's how you pitch the ideal. So if you, if, you, if you play to the strength, which is the autonomy to be smoke free, rather than the autonomy to smoke, then the ideals can actually work for the guys instead of against them. And, and, and that's really what we played to. It's, it's, a, it's similar characteristics, but we're playing to them for a different outcome. So we're looking for a change around that. And, and, and we, we were convinced that, that, that pregnancy and coming into being a new dad was just a time of change. So smoking is often associated with hedonistic kind of practices. You know, it's, 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 about, it's about you, it's about I, um, tends to be um, for you. And so this would be a reason that perhaps you'd be thinking differently in terms of provide a protector that transition to being a dad. So we, we played to that and, and, and really it was, it was strength based. So those ideals weren't quashed, they were just worked in a different angle. And if you think back to, you know, uh, big tobacco has been great at appealing to men's masculine ideals to smoke. I mean, the Marlboro man is a, is a lovely example of, of appealing to a certain demographic or ideal or identities, you know, to help people think about that something they could pro probably do. So we just needed to re-pitch it. You know? Okay, um, Wayne Hartrick has a question. You found good information on how to message men such as being ideal dads. How was this research conducted? Anecdotal, individual interviews, focus groups? So how did you come up with your messages? Okay, so we actually did a lot of individual interviews with dads and um, they were of various ages and not always first time dads. So when we talk about new dads, we mean a dad who's got a new baby and it could be the first baby, it could be the sixth baby, but a new dad. So um, we talked to a lot of dads who, um, had, who were smokers or who had quit smoking um, and I think in the end, we probably talked to 30 or 40 dads, um, quite diverse in terms of ethnicity as well as socioeconomic status um, and the number of children they had. And these interviews, we um, asked them a number of questions about fatherhood, about smoking, about their efforts to stop smoking and um, their interests in, in smoking cessation. We, and so we analyzed those interviews. We've, there's a number of publications that we'd be happy to share with you um, on, on the results from those interviews. And then what we did was we actually took those findings back to, folk, to what we called consultation groups. And we held consultation groups with, again, fathers who were uh, smokers or ex-smokers, their partners, it wasn't exactly their partners, but partners, uh, female partners of men who, who were smoking, thinking that they might be able to help us figure out what to do. We shared findings with them as well, as well as healthcare providers. And so um, we held a number of focus groups, both in Kelowna and in Vancouver, with all of those groups. And basically sharing our findings with them 
getting a lot of validation of our findings in all of those groups, and then posing the question, so what can we do? And, and it's through those, uh, what people told us, that we began to pull together ideas for interventions. And they were often very specific. So for example, some of the fathering groups, we sort of asked them, what should be the main message? If you were gonna talk to another dad, what would you say? And we had them write things, draw messages on posters and write things out that they would say. And, and often it's those exact statements that we've used in our booklets and that have informed some of the messaging that we have in our uh, DIG program. Okay, thanks. And I did want to comment, John, that um, Barbara Dablinas, thank you for your response and, and commented it's tricky. It's a tricky question. Um, Robert, uh, we can't see, the, the presenters can't see the questions, so um, I'm letting him know that you heard him. So um, I have one more question here, and this is from Margaret Sanchetta, and she is actually following up on the diversity um, uh, question that came up earlier and asked if you could um, give some examples of diversity among the participants. And when you talk about diversity, are you only talking about ethnic diversity? Um, could you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. So. Um it's interesting because um, when we talk, oftentimes when we talk about masculinities, we'll, we'll be we're pitching it like it's something that we can grab hold of. Um, so the, one of the points I'd make is that it intersects with culture, it intersects with socioeconomic status, it intersects with class. And so there is diversity within the sample on, on, on all of those measures, if you like. Um, uh, there was diversity in terms of ethnicity, some of these guys uh, were new to Canada. Uh, we had some um, some Asian fellows involved, new dads. Um, we had different socioeconomic status in terms of income, but we also had different occupation groups in, in terms of construction work, in terms of white collar. So there was diversity across. Um, in the booklet, we've been, been called on diversity as well um, within the booklet and, and representing diversity. And so, you know, we've spent a lot of time uh, on the on the booklet, and again with the website, you know, representing diversity within the pages and the images that are used to try and appeal to uh, or not disinclude, you know, uh, certain groups. So I've been uh, we've worked pretty hard at that, but we we did, you know, I think we in terms of talking to different people and a diversity in terms of the sample and a qualitative world, I think we did pretty well in terms of just being able to, to, to talk with people who had different experiences. We, we talked to people here in Kelowna. Um, we, we also uh, talked to people um, the lower mainland. So I felt like we had a reasonable range of diversity within the sample. Okay, we just have time for one more question. No one is standing up, so I'm going to ask you one. And, and I've thought about this before, but I thought about it more when I was listening to your presentation right now. And, and that is, um, I think it's increasingly prevalent that gay men are adopting children. And um, we also know that smoking rates are, uh, tend to be higher in the gay population. And I'm just wondering if either you think this program can be adapted, or how can it be adapted, or do you need a new program if you wanted to address um, gay men who are fathers? It is interesting. I think, I think actually it would be interesting to see if gay men could join this kind of a group, and I think they could actually, because we had actually a, in our small pilot where we developed the uh, DIG program, we actually had quite a wide range of men, and we, even though it was a small number, and we actually were a bit worried about whether they would gel as a group. So we had, you know, a, a 20-year-old new father, proud as ever about his new baby, but he was unemployed. He, he, had, he didn't have much more than high school um, to uh, a 40-year-old man who had six children. His youngest child was one between one and two, um, and uh, a, a guy with a professional uh, occupation. So it's like, oh my gosh, you know, there's such diversity in terms of age, what these men do for a living, uh, the number of children they have, you know, are they gonna actually be able to gel? And in fact, they did, because they gelled around fatherhood. That's what brought them together. They were all fathers, and they all had uh, yeah, very young children. The, the criteria for getting in the group was you had to have a child under the age of two. 
Um, so they were all dealing with the same things, you know, crying babies, sleepless nights, um, but they were all really proud of being fathers and they shared stories of fathering and that was the thing that connected them. And I, can, I think that gay men are also want to be good fathers and could connect with other men around fathering. So I actually think that there may be an opportunity to include gay men in this group. I can't, I can't say that for sure, but I would be willing to give it a try. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. I think we all enjoyed and benefit from it. Thank you. I would like to give our sincerest thanks to all of the pre presenters and for your travel that you have come here and the preparation that you've done. We, we greatly uh, appreciate that. Also want to take and uh, thank uh, the Faculty of Health and Social Development that I uh, provided uh, part of the funding that the School of Social Work has used uh, for, for this uh, program. Uh, the bulk of the funding coming from the Institute, so we want to thank them for the financial support uh, on this. Also want to thank uh, Dr. Carol Gatsy for coming and, and hosting this and, and helping us in such a wonderful way. And I might add that uh, those of you who are here uh, could to be sure and say hello to her. She's quite an expert in, in health prevention herself. I um, want to um, thank the, uh, the staff from the Institute who has worked so hard and, and do things such as take care of me when I come rushing in at the last minute and forget my agenda. Uh, and not sure how I'm supposed to proceed and take care of, they have done a wonderful job. So we thank you for, for uh, all of the work that, have, that has made this possible. Finally, I want to thank those of you in the audience here for your participation, for your interest, and I want to thank those of you out uh, across the land watching and work, looking at this through the, the internet and our online uh, uh, presentations. Thank you for your efforts to be here. We look forward to uh, feedback and look forward to continuing this type of, of interchange on uh, health. Thank you. <laughs>